Yeah. Hello, everyone, again. Uh, here we have Dr. Brett McGuire, who received his BS in chemistry from the University of Illinois at Urbana Champaign in 2009, and then his PhD in physical chemistry at the Caltech in 2014. Uh, he was a National Radio Astronomy Observatory Jansk Fellow and then a NASA Hubble Fellow from 2014 to 2020 at the NRAO and the Center for Astrophysics, Harvard and Smithsonian. In 2020, he started a faculty position at the MIT, where he's now the class of 1943 career development assistant professor of chemistry. Research in his group uses the tools of physical chemistry, molecular spectroscopy, and observational astrophysics to understand how the chemical ingredients for life evolve with and help shape the formation of stars and planets. And I'll hang over to him now. And yes, thank you. Awesome. Thanks for that great introduction. Thanks everybody for showing up today. I'll just get some screen share going here and wait for it to actually pop up. There we go. All right. So uh, I'm excited to talk to you all today about some of the work my colleagues and I have been doing uh, over the last several years, looking at some really complex and cool and potentially biologically uh, informative chemistry uh, going on in some of the, the uh, most interesting and active sources of star formation in our universe. So I want to start off uh, uh, and, and pretend that we're all still in person. Um, if we were actually meeting in person, what I would do is I would ask everybody to shake hands with their neighbor, which I know is very scary these days, right? But if you go to shake hands with somebody, you're going to shake a right hand with the right hand or a left hand with a left hand. And that's because to do the opposite there is incredibly cringe and uncomfortable, right? <clears throat> and that's because of a unique property of our hands, which is going to play heavily into the science that I'm talking about today. And that's that our hands, while they are identical mirror images of one another, are not actually identical structures in 3D space, right? If you line up your hands so that the palms are facing the same directions, your thumbs are then facing in opposite directions. If you line up so that your thumbs are facing in the same direction, well, then you have one palm down and, and one palm up. And so while our hands look identical to one another, they're actually what we call non-superimposable mirror images, meaning that when you take the reflection in there, you can't line them up through any combination of rotation or translation in 3D space and get a perfect alignment. And this is a property called chirality. It comes from the Greek word chire, which literally means hand, right? So hands are the basis for this word because they're wonderful, wonderful demonstrations of this property uh, that uh, uh, 3D objects have. Now, I put this up at the beginning as a preface because the talk is going to focus on chirality and the implications of chirality in biochemistry and the origins of life and our explorations of, of chirality uh, in the interstellar medium. But I'm actually an astrochemist. Uh, so what I want to do is, is take a step back from chirality and introduce the field of astrochemistry, which is going to be the, the framework by which we discuss the role of chirality in these different subjects. So I said I'm an astrochemist, that means I study astrochemistry, and to me, astrochemistry is the study of molecules in space, where they are, how they got there, and what they're doing. This isn't the only definition of astrochemistry, but it's the one that defines uh, the sort of work that I do. Now, chemistry and molecules are important at every single step along the process of forming stars and planets. Astrochemistry is occurring, molecules are reacting, all the way back to the very beginning of the story. So if we take a look at the cosmic chemistry life cycle, it of course all starts at the Big Bang. And the Big Bang made mostly hydrogen and helium. The universe got a smattering of lithium and beryllium as a treat, but it really wasn't until the first stars were born of this hydrogen and helium, and then through their nuclear processes synthesized the heavier atoms, the carbon, the oxygen, the nitrogen, the sulfur, the phosphorus, the things that we know are critical to the molecular and chemical makeup of life today. 
these elements weren't synthesized until those stars chewed through the hydrogen and helium and eventually died seeding the universe, seeding their host galaxies with these heavier elements necessary to do chemistry, the kind of chemistry that we are uh, used to thinking of in our organic chemistry classes or in undergraduate general chemistry or in our biochemistry classes. Now, this material was flung far and wide, cools off to something like five or 10 Kelvin into these diffuse molecular clouds. But even at five or 10 Kelvin, Chemistry is occurring, right? On the surfaces of interstellar dust grains, molecules and atoms have frozen out and are reacting with one another. Ultraviolet radiation and cosmic rays are impinging on this gas and this dust, driving reactions forward. All of this is happening at very low temperatures in these stellar nurseries, these large interstellar clouds, where the material will eventually condense down and collapse to form new stars. Now, these new stars are, of course, going to eat a lot of this material, but the material that isn't eaten is then subjected to increased energy as these stars inject heat and other types of energy, say UV radiation, uh, into this system, driving chemical processes forward, driving reactions forward that might take more heat or energy to go or will go faster when they get this additional injection of heat and energy. We now know that around many or perhaps even most of these stars, one or more planets will form, and those planets are being constantly bombarded by the early chemical remnants of their natal molecular clouds of the stellar nursery as comets and meteorites, which are laced with the ice and the gas and the dust from that early stellar nursery, bombard the surface of the planet, delivering water, delivering the raw organic materials necessary for life. This is a process that's still happening in our solar system. It's still happening to Earth even this day as small meteorites from the original molecular cloud that our solar system was born from are falling down through our atmosphere every day, continuing to deliver molecular content. Now, on at least one example we know of, that early chemical inventory will come together and form life, right? So that's, that's Earth. Uh, and regardless uh, of whether life is formed from this chemical inventory or not, everything will eventually be destroyed in some sort of fiery cataclysm uh, of one kind or another as the star dies, uh, the planets freeze or burn, and all of that material is ejected back into the cosmic chemical life cycle. Now, the point here is that chemistry is happening at every single step of this process. Chemical reactions are not just bystanders either. The chemical composition of the cloud, of the planet, of the meteorites, of the surface of the planet, uh, these drive the physical processes behind the formation mechanisms. So the chemistry is actually influencing the composition of the planet. It can influence where a planet forms in a solar system. It can influence whether or not the raw ingredients for life are delivered in the balance that we think is required for life on Earth or in a different balance, which might not support the life that we, we know of here, but could support another sort form of life. That's all because of the chemistry. So the chemistry is not just being shaped by this cosmic life cycle. It is shaping this cosmic life cycle. As an astrochemist, I want to understand on a detailed molecule by molecule and reaction by reaction basis, how the chemistry moves from step to step, right? The fundamental driving question of astrochemistry is how in the heck do you make a cat from hydrogen and helium? How can we trace those elements from the Big Bang, through stellar nucleosynthesis, through a molecular cloud, through star and planet formation, understand every reaction that they undergo to deliver the raw ingredients for life to the surface of the planet to make cute kittens. Now, that's astrochemistry as a whole. I want to zoom back in now to a particular branch of astrochemistry, a particular question of astrochemistry, and that comes back to chirality that I was talking about earlier. I use our hands as an example of chiral objects, but of course, we're going to be talking about chemistry. So what does this have to do with chemistry? Well, molecules can be chiral as well. 
So here I've shown a, a schematic sketch of a molecule, bromochlorofluoromethane. Um, this is a, a molecule that I, I believe exists solely to demonstrate chirality. Um, it has its own Wikipedia page just because this is the stereotypical molecule that is used in, in general chemistry textbooks and courses uh, all across the world. So if you're not familiar with the notation here, uh, what I've done is I have put in a solid line See if I can get a cursor going here, maybe. Oh, this may put the animation forward. Yeah, yeah, half a second. All right, there's your cursor. Um, this solid line here represents this bond between carbon and hydrogen being in the plane of the screen, all right? The dashed bond means that fluorine is projecting out in 3D space from your monitor. And these dashed bonds here are projecting the bromine and the chlorine in behind the monitor in 3D space. So go ahead and push that animation forward here. Now, this is one formulation of this molecule. But if I project its mirror image to the right side of the screen here, right, you'll see we have the exact same molecule. Right? The atoms are bonded together in exactly the same way. We have a carbon bonded to a hydrogen, a chlorine, a bromine, and a fluorine. Right? However, these are not actually identical because if you look at them and you try to rotate them and align them in 3D space, you won't be able to do it. Right? The fluorines are both now pointing out of the screen and the hydrogen is in the plane of the screen with the carbon. Right? On the right, the chlorine is behind the screen to the left. Now on the left hand side, chlorine is behind the screen to the right. If we rotate the molecule on the right so that the chlorines now line up, so that they're both on the right-hand side as we're looking at them, well, we've moved that fluorine poking back into the screen, right? There's no way that you can rotate or translate these molecules and get them to align perfectly in 3D space. Now, sets of molecules that are bonded together identically, they have the same chemical makeup and the same bond structure, but just have different 3D images when they're projected across the mirror plane, are what we call enantiomers. Again, this comes from the Greek, enantios, meaning opposite, and meros, part, right? So these are two different molecules. They are enantiomers of one another because they represent opposite parts. They represent uh, the reflection, the non-superimposable mirror image, the structure that you can generate that is identical in terms of the bonds, but can't be reproduced. It's the opposite way of looking at it in 3D space. Now, there's a bunch of different ways that you'll see these enantiomers labeled in the literature, and it has evolved over time. Uh, there's been some attempt to standardize, but it really doesn't work very well. So you have to get used to all of them. Sometimes they're referred to as left and right, as in left and right-handed. Sometimes they're called L and D for levorotary and dextrorotary. Sometimes they're called S and R for sinister and rectus, uh, standing for uh, evil and good, because of course we're influenced by the past where left-handed things were of the devil, so they are sinister. Um, in any case, these are just different ways of labeling one enantiomer of another and distinguishing that these are the same molecule bonded together the same way, just different in 3D space. Now, enantiomers, as you might have uh, uh, anticipated here, have unique chemical and physical properties. Um, and we'll, let's take a look at that right now. And we're going to do this by comparing to the unique chemical and physical properties of our hands. Right? So how are enantiomers, how are our hands alike? You have a pair of enantiomers, you have a pair of hands. Well, enantiomers have the same atoms, as I've said and the same bonds. They're bonded together the same way. And that's analogous to looking at your hand and realizing each of your hands has the same bones and they're bonded together the same way with the same tendons. They're identical structures bonded together the same way. Now, two enantiomers will have the same physical properties. They will melt, boil, and freeze at the same temperatures. And although I highly recommend you don't try it at home, your hands will also melt, boil, and freeze at the same temperatures. Now, enantiomers also have what are called the same spectra. This is the way that these molecules interact with light, right? So this is analogous to your hands having the same shadow, meaning that if you have, in perfect lighting conditions, your two hands lit from above, and you're just looking at the shadow on the ground, 
you can't tell if the shadow that you're seeing is a right hand pointed down or a left hand pointed up. They're going to cast the same shadow. The light is interacting in the same way. But they are different in some special ways. Right? Your hands interact differently with other handed objects. Right? So you can think about a, a baseball glove. Right? These are left and right handed. It would be very difficult to put your right hand into a left handed baseball glove and, and vice versa. Um, another common interaction is scissors. Almost all scissors are made for right-handed people. So, sorry, left-handed people. Almost all of the scissors are made for right-handed people because that's what most of the population is. And so interacting with this handed object is challenging if you are left-handed. Another way to looking at it is your interaction with other people who are left or right-handed. Right? If you are a uh, left-handed violin player and you're playing on your own, well, there's absolutely no problem. Everything goes swimmingly. However, if you're playing next to two right-handed violin players, things can get really ugly really fast. And that's because you're operating in a different direction in 3D space. <clears throat> so the interactions of your hands, your handed objects, with other handed objects are different. And the same thing goes for enantiomers for handed molecules. So here I see it, I'm showing you the structure of a molecule called carvone. And we have the sinister and rectus, the S and the R enantiomer here on either side. Now the S enantiomer of carvone is the key component that gives caraway seeds. Those are the, the seeds that you often see in, in a, at least American style rye bread, its distinct flavor and smell. On the other hand, our carbone is the prim primary flavorant and, and odorant in spearmint. These are the exact same molecules, They're the exact same atoms bonded together in the same way. They're just mirror images of one another. And the reason that they give these different tastes and smell is because the taste and smell receptors in our tongue and in our nose are themselves chiral. They are handed. And so the two different handednesses of carbone interact differently with our taste and smell receptors, which are handed and produce these different senses, <clears throat> which I think is really, really cool. Now, these are both things that you can buy in the store. So you can go and do the uh, test yourself. Excuse me. <clears throat> uh, and it actually was really cool. Before I knew that these were related, I couldn't really taste uh, or smell anything related between the two uh, uh, flavors and smells. But actually, once you know what you're looking for, especially in caraway seeds, you can get just a, just a hint of smearment behind it, um, either because there's a little bit of cross-contamination of our carvone in there or because uh, the interaction is, is, is similar, if different. Now, another uh, uh, common example of this in human health is naproxen. This is a leave, right? Well, it, it turns out that actually a leave is all S. I mean, S naproxen is the formulation of the molecule, the enantiomer of the molecule, which has pain relieving properties. And it turns out to be really, really important that it's only S that goes into those Aleve tablets because R naproxen is a potent liver toxin. And so it's really important in the pharmaceutical industry that they keep track of which enantiomer is used to go into the medicines. Now, you don't have to worry. We have processes to separate these out really well and make sure that we're only making the S naproxen. But it just goes to show you again that the handedness of molecules can have stark biological effects just because of the, the interactions with other handed things within our body. Now, for the purposes of this talk, I want to talk about handednesses in a different aspect of biology. That is handedness as it relates to our proteins to our amino acid structures. So our proteins are made up of sequences of amino acids. Amino acids are small molecules that are clicked together in, in sort of Lego-like building blocks in large sequence chains to make up our proteins. And all of the amino acids except the simplest one, glycine, are chiral. Now, that's fine, that's all well and good. Large molecules are chiral, but there's something interesting here. You see, in biology, all of our amino acids are left-handed. And in fact, all of the sugars that we use in biology are right-handed. This is a property called homochirality. 
all life on Earth uses only a single enantiomer of amino acids, sugars, or other biomolecules. Right? Now, we just went through all the ways that enantiomers are similar to one another, right? They have the same energetics, the same melting, boiling, and freezing points. They're bonded together uh, in the exact same way. Life could have used right-handed amino acids and left-handed sugars and would work just fine. But life has chosen to use all of one-handedness versus the other. Now, this has some profound implications. It means that if you were to go to another planet and visit one of their burger joints, so this is a famous burger joint uh, in Atlanta, uh, in uh, uh, the state of Georgia in the US, right? If the burgers on that planet are made of left-handed proteins, well, then you'd be fine. If the burgers, if all life on that other planet was instead made up of right-handed amino acids and right-handed proteins, you wouldn't be able to eat them, right? They would have no biological impact because none of that protein that your body wants to uh, uh, um, use in, in its biological processes would be biologically available. You, your chemistry wouldn't know how to interact with it. And I think that's really profoundly cool. It means that if we search for life elsewhere, there's a possibility that uh, it can't eat us which is really exciting because it's a one less reason for them to destroy us. But the question remains, why is life using left-handed amino acids? As I said, we could perfectly well use all right-handed amino acids. We just have to pick one in order to build the structures that we have, to have the interactions that we have. But we've chosen left. So why have we chosen left? Well, there's a couple of different theories out there, and I don't have the answer for you here. I'm just going to present some of the theories and then tell you the one that I favor, but I could be wrong. The first theory is that homochirality arose because life started on chiral mineral structures deep in our ocean near these black smoker hydrothermal vents, right? Mineral structures themselves also chiral. Uh, if, if you're not uh, uh, picking up on the theme here, lots of things in life and uh, in the universe in general are chiral. And so if these mineral structures were the catalytic sites, were the, the uh, substrates upon which early life-bearing molecules or life-giving molecules were formed, then those could influence the chirality and favor one enantiomer over the other. It could build up an excess of one or the other. And as soon as an excess is made, life is going to grab that, amplify it, and run away. It's just evolutionarily advantageous. So that's one perfectly reasonable theory. Another reasonable theory is that it was completely random, right? Some dungeon master somewhere in our simulation of a universe rolled a natural one and decided that humanity is left-handed now in, in terms of our amino acids. That's also a totally valid theory, right? That there was just some small fluctuation, which gave us a little extra of left-handed amino acids when life was first getting started, and it amplified and ran with it. And if life had started three weeks later and the excess was the other direction, well, maybe we would have been right-handed. Totally reasonable. I subscribe to a, a different theory, though. And that comes from evidence from something that happened back in uh, September of 1969 in a tiny little town just north of Melbourne, Australia, called Murchison. Now, this is a town where a meteorite crashed to the surface of the planet. This meteorite, now known as the Murchison meteorite, has been one of our best ways of studying the early chemical remnants of our solar system. And there's two reasons for that. One, it just happens to be chemically rich, which is great. Uh, but two, uh, the townsfolk saw it crash and, according to what I've read, immediately went out, found the meteorite, and stuck the pieces in their freezers to keep it cold, pristine, and intact, which is great. So we are still working with samples of this meteorite today. And it turns out that if you look in the Murchison meteorite, you find amino acids, which is cool. So amino acids, building blocks of proteins, the building blocks for life were present in the early solar system in, in our early natal molecular cloud and were delivered to the surface of our planet potentially seeding the chemical pool for life. Awesome, right? What about the handedness? Well, most of the amino acids are what we call racemic. It's a 50-50 mixture, left-handed and right-handed. And that's to be expected, right? I told you there's no energetic difference between the two. So if you're just gonna make them, you're gonna make an equal quantity usually. 
However, a number of the amino acids did show an excess, and they showed an excess of left. Not all of the amino acids showed an excess, but every single one that showed an excess had an excess of left. And it's not just in Murchison. We've seen this in numerous other meteorite samples now. Every single convincing measurement of an excess of handedness of amino acids in a meteorite that I know about have all been left, which is really cool because that means that maybe we just started with that little excess and then life amplified it. But the question remains then, great, so maybe this is why we're left-handed, but why was there an excess of left-handed amino acids in this meteorite to begin with? And I don't think it comes down to how they were formed. In fact, I think, and, and many folks think, this is not my theory, I think this comes down to how they were destroyed. So if you start with a 50-50 mixture of left-handed and right-handed amino acids, which is how chemistry will generally tend to form them in vacuum, it comes down to destruction. Some process comes along and decides that it's going to destroy amino acids. Now, generally, this process is non-selective. In this case, I'm going to be talking mostly about destruction by ultraviolet radiation. It tends to be really harsh to small molecules like this. And that's going to blow up most molecules. But if we do the count, we see what's left over. We can formulate that there was a process that destroyed just a little bit more of the right-handed amino acids than the left-handed amino acids. And so even though we formed an equal quantity to start with, our destruction process left us with an excess of left-handed to then be delivered to the surface of our planet. So there's two reasonable ways to think about how you could have a process that preferentially destroys one-handedness or the other. The first one is one that's been debated for 50 years or so now, but finally had some really solid experimental uh, evidence and, and, and maybe even um, um, some folks would say proof now uh, that this is a possibility. Right? And that is the selective destruction of molecules, not by radiation, we will talk about it in a second, but by electrons. You see, when uh, a species undergoes beta decay, right, it can spit out an electron. And this happens everywhere in the universe all the time. Nuclear decay, molecules decaying radioactively, emitting electrons. Those electrons are energetic. They spit spit themselves out, run into molecules like amino acids, and destroy them, chemically break them up. But it turns out that these electrons themselves are chiral because they're spinning preferentially in one direction or another. They're polarized electrons. And so there's an excess, I, I believe it's an excess of left-handed polarized electrons from this decay process, but I could be wrong. The, the answer is in this... Uh, this article here, which would then preferentially interact with one handedness of a molecule versus the other and destroy one handedness of a molecule versus the other. Now, if this is actually how enantiomeric excesses are built up in space, then it would be universal in nature, right? Because this process is the same everywhere in the universe. And that means that anywhere we look, we should see the same excess of amino acids, we should see more left if this is the way in which it's made. Now that would be cool, it would be an elegant solution, but I think it would be kind of boring because that means that all the aliens can eat us. And that means that they're gonna have you know, the same chemical structure everywhere we go, yeah, it's kind of boring. Mm -hmm. There is another possibility and that's a similar process, but instead using, as I mentioned earlier, ultraviolet radiation. Now, ultraviolet radiation is just as destructive as electrons, maybe even more so. It's going to blow up a lot of different molecules in space. And just like electrons, light can be polarized. So, and we can actually show this in the laboratory, if you shine circularly polarized light with an excess of left-handed circularly polarized or right-handed circularly polarized UV light onto a sample of chiral molecules, you will get leftover after the destruction, more of one handedness versus the other. Now, the reason that I think this is cool is because there are many different sources of ultraviolet light in the universe. One of the most prominent is, of course, stars around which we are forming planets. And what's even more cool is that the excess of circularly polarized UV light 
changes handedness depending on what star you're looking at. So in one star forming region, there might be an excess of left-handed circularly polarized UV radiation destroying things. And in its nearest neighbor, it could be an excess of right-handed circularly polarized things destroying things. And that means that the handedness of molecules, the handedness of life in one portion of our galaxy could be completely different than in another portion of our galaxy. And that's a testable prediction if we can detect a chiral molecule in these different regions our galaxy, and then hopefully detect an excess of one handedness or another of that molecule, match it to the excess of UV light, and come up with a conclusion to this hypothesis. Now, there's a couple of problems with that. Um, the main one being that up until very recently, we had never detected a chiral molecule in space. Right? And that actually is kind of surprising because humanity is really freaking good at detecting molecules outside our solar system. What I've plotted here on the left is the total number of molecules that we have seen using astronomy, mostly radio astronomy, outside of our solar system since the first molecules were detected back in 1937. 272 individual chemical species have been definitively detected outside our solar system. And they're wacky, crazy, weird molecules, all the way from uh, methanol and ethanol, uh, literally vodka seen in space, to these large molecules called C60 buckyballs up in the top right, look like soccer balls right, that are seen uh, in the, the envelopes of dying stars and after supernova explosions. The chemistry of space is incredibly rich. However, despite this huge chemical inventory, until about five years ago, none of the molecules that we saw had been chiral, which means we didn't have a way to look for this signature of handedness in space. So that's something that I set out to change as part of my graduate and postdoctoral work. And the molecule that we tried to target to try to detect in space is this molecule here, propylene oxide. It's one of the smallest chiral molecules that you can make using common atoms that are available in space, in this case, carbon in black, hydrogen in white, and oxygen in red. So I wanted to go hunt this molecule in space and see if I could detect its signature. And we do that through observations of its rotational spectrum. So the pattern of light that this molecule gives off or absorbs in this case, as it tumbles freely end over end in space. And that spectrum is unique to each molecule, the same way that your shadow is unique to you. It is different from everybody else's shadow due to the way that your structure is different. Of course, in the rotational spectrum of the two enantiomers, as I said 15 slides ago or so, is identical. So at the moment, we're just looking for this pattern, which is unique to this molecule, but can't tell us what handedness is there. Now, if we're going to go hunt for this molecule in space, we need to give ourselves the best chance to detect it, which means we need to look in one of the best places in space to detect new molecules. And that's this region, as I've circled right here, in the center of our galaxy, it's called Sagittarius B2N. It's a massive star forming region, a massive molecular cloud with many embedded young stars, very near, relatively speaking, to the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy. And this is the location in which 25% of all new molecules in space have been detected for the first time. Now, this is an image I actually took of Sagittarius B2N. Um, from the, the summit of Mauna Kea in Hawaii. Um, if you can see this little silhouette down here, this shadow, uh, this is uh, the shadow of, of Brandon Carroll, who was my, my partner on this project uh, and a co-first author on, on this work. Now, if we want to detect a molecule in space and we want to give ourselves the best chance and we've gone to the best region, we also need to use the best telescope. And for us, that best telescope is the Green Bank Telescope shown here. This is a massive radio telescope located high in the Appalachian Mountains in Green Bank, West Virginia. Right? This telescope is 100 meters across, 
And its only purpose is to collect photons as sensitively as possible. Now, just think about the scale there. You can fit an entire football stadium in there with grandstands. American football or European football doesn't matter. You can fit it in there and still have room on either side. And its only purpose is to stare at space and collect spectra, collect the signatures and patterns of light unique to molecules and allow us to see if they're there or not. So this is what the spectrum of Sagittarius B2N looks like. Um, it turns out, since this is such a great place for molecules, we didn't look for just propylene oxide. We tried to get the signature of every molecule that was there. And you can see here emission lines pointing up and absorption lines pointing down. All of these are from the signals of all of the molecules present in the, in the source, all rotating and spinning and emitting their light and patterns at us that, that overlap on one another and tell us that they're present also tell us how much of them are there and what their temperature are and, and how fast they're moving, all sorts of fun things like that. Now, because you get all of the molecules at once, you have to be sure that the pattern you see from your molecule is actually belonging to your molecule. And that means we generally want to see at least three pieces to that pattern. So with the Green Bank Telescope, I can zoom in here and I can show you some of the actual spectra. On the left, where that red line is, that's where we expected, because we measured it in the laboratory, the first two pieces that we could see of propylene oxide spectra to arise. So we should see two dips in our spectrum right about where that red line is. And we actually see that there. And these are from the 312 to 303 and 211 to 202 rotational transitions of this molecule, which is great. Right? These are strong signals. They're, they're, they're really there and they're quite clear. But we should have seen a third signal located around... 13 gigahertz, showing in the bottom panel here from the 110 to 101 transition. And instead, this is what we saw. This is not molecular signal. This is noise. This is actually noise from a direct TV satellite, satellite television that is beaming interference down to the Green Bank Telescope. And we couldn't get away, get away from that. We, we can't turn the satellites off. Um, so we were kind of screwed. But it turns out that uh, apparently Australians don't like satellite television. So we went down to a, a telescope called the Parkes Telescope down in Australia, where we didn't have this radio frequency interference. And we actually saw bright absorption from our third signal from propylene oxide exactly where we expected it to be, which was great. We now have a confirmed detection of a chiromolecule in space for the first time. Now the question becomes, can we determine if there's more of one handedness or another? And that turns out to be really hard. See here on earth, we can play some really clever tricks to separate out one handedness from another and measure them, right? We do that using something, for instance, called a chiral column. If you take a mixture of two enantiomers, red and blue of a molecule, so it make purple on the left here, and you put it at the top of a tube filled with a chiral mineral substrate, and you let gravity sink it through, what's going to happen? Well, the substrate is chiral. So one handedness of the molecule is going to interact more strongly with it and flow through slower. Right? So in this case, the blue gets held back a little bit because it's flowing through slower because it's interacting more strongly with the chirality of the substrate. And we collect all of the red first, and then we collect all of the blue. We've separated our molecules and we can measure them. Sagittarius B2N is 25,000 light years away. We can't do that. So there is one theoretical possibility of how we could do this, and it comes back to the interaction of handed light with handed molecules. And I'm going to give you an analogy here for how this works using our, our vault boy here from Fallout. And I'm going to equip the vault boy with a bolt gun. And the vault boy is going to be shooting left-handed threaded bolts at piles of nuts. And one of these piles of nuts is going to be exclusively right threaded, and one of these piles of nuts is going to be exclusive left-handed threaded. And on the right here, you can see what's going to happen. How many of these bolts are going to be stopped by this pile, right? And you can see that I have exaggerated here, but I've said that, well, most of the bolts are just going to get stopped, right? Because they're just impacting. That's what happens with light. Most of the light gets absorbed by the molecule. But a few more bolts are going to get stuck with that left-handed threaded pile. And why is that? Because there's one additional way to lose energy, to capture a bolt there, and that's to thread one of those bolts uh, directly into a nut in that pile because they match because the handednesses interact. 
We can do the same thing with light in theory. This is a process that works in the infrared here on Earth quite frequently. Not so sure that anybody will be able to measure it in space, but if we can, this is how it's going to happen. We're going to use our GBT, which can separate out right-handed and left-handed polarized light signals. We're going to then look at the absorption signal from propylene oxide, right? We're also going to look at the corresponding signals from non-chiral molecules. Now, anything that is not chiral or is emitting, well, they're going to have the same amount of light in both left and right-handed circuitly polarized light. A non-chiral molecule will not absorb more than one left-handed or right-handed uh, circularly polarized light. But a chiral molecule, if there is an excess of one or the other, just like that bolt pile had more of one than the other, might absorb a little bit more of one light than the other. Now, this is going to be an incredibly weak signal. I don't think our detectors are currently capable of seeing something that weak, but we're going to keep pushing on it. We're going to keep moving in that direction. So I can't actually tell you whether or not there's more of the right or the left-handed propylene oxide present in the source from this technique right now. I have to wait to see if these uh, technologies can evolve far enough to see those signals. The last slide here that I'll say is one other possibility is that a, a new telescope called the Next Generation VLA, a very large array, is going to come online sometime in the middle of the next decade. This is going to allow us to map the signal from propylene oxide, both in Sagittarius B2N and toward a number of different sources. So the idea here is that if we can map the signal from this molecule, not left-handed or right-handed, just the signal from the molecule, toward sources that have an excess of UV circular polarization, which we can measure, we can then go into the laboratory and say, okay, I know how much propylene oxide is present in this source, and I know what the flux of left-handed versus right-handed circularly polarized light is. Let's run the analogous experiment in the laboratory and see if those conditions generate an excess of one or the other. See if we can back out a possibility. So uh, with that, I'll go ahead and, uh, and wrap up here. I'll acknowledge um, my, my wonderful young group at MIT, uh, all my sources of, of funding and affiliations, my wonderful collaborators here, uh, the ways you can get in, in touch with me online if you'd like, and I'm happy to, to answer any questions anybody might have. Thanks for, thanks for listening. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, yeah, it was a brilliant talk. Um, now, if anyone has any questions, you're very welcome to tap in, in the chat or unmute yourself or raise a hand. And while you're thinking about a question, I actually had a question. So I was sure. wondering um, when you decided to hunt for a certain molecule for its chirality in space to sort of determine how do you decide which molecule would be that, basically? <laughs> Yeah, no, that's a great question. It really was, this was one of the smallest and simplest chemical structures that has the property of being chiral that we could think of. Um, so most of the molecules that we see in space that are made of carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen, in order to be, um, be detectable, they have to be relatively simple because you want to make a lot of them. Um, and those simple structures just aren't complex enough to have this property of, of, of handedness. Right? You have to add enough atoms to the system to be able to arrange them in enough unique ways to actually find this, this mirror image. Um, and so propylene oxide, it might not be the smallest carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen molecule that's chiral, but it's very close. Um, so that means that the, the chemistry that operates in space had a really good chance of being able to make enough of it for us to see. And even then, the signal was really weak. Yeah, okay, that makes very much sense. Okay, thank you. And Emily has a question. Hi, thanks so much for your talk. Um, my question is, um, if there's a region in space which was equally exposed to left and right, um, polarized light do you think that would um, have create the possibility of life that can handle both left and right amino acids ah great question um, it would have to be life unlike anything that we know today um, so one of the really cool things about having um, 
homochirality baked into, literally baked into our DNA, uh, is that it allows for larger 3D structures to be made. And so um, the way that proteins fold into helices and sheets is only possible because all of the amino acids share one chirality. That larger structure on, on which our biology depends, these very large macromolecular structures sometimes, these alpha helices and beta sheets and, and even the, the helices of DNA and RNA are only possible because of the homochirality of the underlying building blocks. If you had a mixture, you would never be able to make these larger scale structures. That doesn't mean that life couldn't be formed that uses those mixed chirality structures, but none of the life that we know of on Earth could possibly function like that. Um, we would all just disintegrate. Our biology doesn't operate without homochirality. Yeah, thanks so much. That's really interesting. Thank you. And Rupender has a question. Yeah. Hi, Brett. Fantastic hey. talk. I really enjoyed it. Thanks. I have a quick question. So you clearly explain fave theory about the amplification or sort of origin of chirality by destruction. And that could be proton, that could be light or by natural randomness. And I think the presupposition there was or axiom that all the sort of amino acid has been formed, imagine, and then how they have been destroyed. This is where perhaps the... We organic synthetic chemists, uh, or at least the community who's working on origin of life and, and chirality, sometimes propose that there could be, you know, some reactions uh, from the racemate uh, without the interaction of light or proton or electron. Uh, such as SOI reaction, I think it was like about some 30, 40 years ago, somebody showed that you can start with totally racemic, I mean, it's very difficult to have the 50, 50, like 100% racemic, right? Yeah. And so there is always a bit one molecule off, something like that. And they say that was good enough, uh, and then they could uh, demonstrate the amplification. Uh, have you guys out in astrochemistry uh, field consider that and then how from the astrochemistry point of view you're going to sort of verify yeah no that's a that's a great question um so if you have a racemic mixture which again it uh given uh no external forces right yeah. the amino acid should form racemic averaged over say a molecular cloud, right? Local variations though will change, absolutely. It depends on which particular cube of gas you are looking at, right? Because randomness is not perfectly distributed. You have to average over something, right? Yeah. And the question then becomes, how do you amplify that for one handedness or the other? And can you do that amplification without life? And to my knowledge, there have been, I think, either two or three studies that show an abiotic pathway to complete amplification going all the way to homochirality from a racemic or just barely non-racemic mixture. All of the other ways to do it require life. And the really cool thing about that then, at least to me, is that if we do detect homochirality, mm -hmm. say in our samples from Mars or Titan, yeah. then it's highly, highly unlikely that anything other than a biological process could cause it because we just can't come up with another way to do it. Yeah. Um, you can certainly get small excesses from formation, again, on a chiral catalyst. So on the mineral surfaces of uh, say an interstellar dust grain, those can be chiral. And so you could build up a small local access there, absolutely. But how do you make homochirality? How do you make a complete excess of one or the other without life? That, it turns out, we think right now is extremely challenging. And in fact, the, the, the couple examples that I can think of were so 
over-engineered and heavily tailored to get this one exact outcome in an abiotic way that yeah. it makes it, I, I think, extremely unlikely to be able to do that without life. I don't know if that answers your question or not. No, I think that's a reasonable hypothesis. Yeah, no, I, I think it do it partly, of course. One quick question on that. You mm -hmm. mentioned that so far in the space, it's about 250 or some molecule has been detected. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering, is there any like amino acids on, on the ah, list? Great question. There was a claim for detection of glycine uh, mm -hmm. about 15 years ago. That turned out to, to not be correct. Um, however, I think given the complexity of the molecules that we are seeing right now, and given the, um, the uh, our knowledge of the way chemistry is happening, I would be shocked if we didn't actually detect definitively glycine within the next decade. I think given the power of our telescopes um, and what we're learning about you know, where to look in space and how to look, I, I would be shocked if we do not detect glycine. Um, past that, maybe alanine. After that, I am certain, uh, I, I would say with as certain as anybody can be that all of the amino acids for life are being synthesized in space. Um, the question is, how much of them? Any molecule you can think of, given the size and timescales of space, has probably been made someplace once in the entire universe outside of our planet, right? So sure. it's a question of numbers in order to detect. Mm -hmm. So I, I think we're very likely to detect glycine. I think there's a possibility we'll detect alanine. Anything after that, um, we'd have to get really lucky or the chemistry would have to have a something... Um, out of balance that specifically favors, I don't know, tyrosine or proline or something uh, at the expense of everything else. Fantastic. Uh, Thank you. Yep. We are, by the way, detecting a bunch of amino acids in comets and meteorites, though. Um, uh -huh. So we can't see them outside our solar system yet, but we know they're there. Perfect. Good. Yeah, thank you very much. And if um, Mallard's phone, and I will ask John Mead. My, oh, hi, Mallard. Yeah, hello. Oh, hi. Hi. Susan Gray, thank you very much for your presentation. It's really interesting. May I ask you, because you really answered the question, when you're looking for the amino acids, do you find that they're alone or attached to, say, a mineral? or an inorganic polymer or a piece of rock. So you mentioned the meteorite. Mm -hmm. um, do you yeah. mind if I ask that? But in the lab, we've been able, it has been, there is literature research and literature about having an amino acid attached to bentonite, vermiculite, talc, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And I, I will preface this by saying that I, the, the the actual laboratory work on the on the meteorites is not stuff that I've done. Um, so this is this is from my reading of the literature, mainly by um, Jamie L. Stilla and uh, um, oh, and I'm going to blank on his name, uh, the first name, but Glavin and Dworkin, wonderful wonderful uh, folks working at NASA Goddard. Um, but my understanding is that the processes by which they are studying these in meteorites don't allow them to get that, that information because basically what they have to do is um, wash the meteorites in a, a solvent which gets the amino acids washed out of the sample itself. In fact, gets all of the soluble organic matter out of the meteorite itself, hopefully without any alteration. Uh, and then can pass that through typically a, a gas chromatic graph mass spectrometer um, to, to get the identification. Um, they've been doing that for, for a couple of decades, um, basically, before they were convinced that they were seeing amino acids, because the, the problem was, how do you know that you're not seeing terrestrial contamination or alteration from the process of extraction? Um, and, and the way that they, they feel like they have uh, solidified that is because the isotopic enrichment, the 13C signature in the amino acids that they're getting is not terrestrial. It does not match the, the carbon-13 enrichment that we see here on, on the planet. Um, so that's how they're sure that what they're seeing is extraterrestrial in origin. However, in order to get those out, 
they wash them out of any binding that they might have had to mineral surfaces or to uh, insoluble organic matter or anything like that, um, just as part of the process, unfortunately. Um, so I, I think, yeah, the answer is we don't know, although I would strongly suspect that a lot of that formation is catalyzed by surface processes, by interactions with surfaces. Thank you very much for answering and considering. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, if anyone has another question, uh, feel free to yeah, unmute or directly. And if not, um, thank you very much again. It was an amazing talk. And yeah, um, Susan thanks you, but it, she, yeah, she types in the chat that she thanks you. And yeah, I hope everyone has enjoyed it. And yeah, very welcome to awesome. join us on our talks. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody, for the invitation. Take care, everyone. Bye bye. Okay, how do I stop the recording? Okay.